Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you, and Indrani, for organizing this. Uh, I was uh, asked to talk about integrable systems and Higgs bundles, and the way that I want to do it today is by uh, explaining to you, so the integrable system we're talking about here comes from the Hitching vibration, a way that Hitching in 87, when trying to study the space of solutions of the equations that Richard told us about, he devised a way of uh, fibering that modelized space over a nice vector space that gave us a, a, an integrable system for certain groups, and then it was generalized to other groups. So I want to tell you about the Hitching vibration, but in a setup that's the one that I've been using lately, uh, related to physics, because I find it inspiring to think about physics and mirror symmetry, Langlands duality. I want to tell you about these integrable systems in relation to that. So I'll be telling you about uh, complex groups first. So my plan for this lecture and the future lectures, so my one, two, three will be each lecture. So today I want to tell you the setup. So the basic definitions will, will go over some basic examples to be sure that we know what Higgs bundles in the, in the terms and, and sense that we're using it here are. We're going to see the setup for complex groups and for real groups, so complex, complex, and real. And then I want to introduce for you already today the way of thinking of models of Higgs bundles in terms of brains, so from the physics language of string theory. So uh, we're going to do the setup for complex and real groups and, and talk about brains. Uh, brains as spaces of Higgs bundles with certain properties. Once we talk about these things, we'll be ready later on to see the different types of brains that appear. Some types will be giving us the complex integrable systems that Hitchin realized in 87. So we'll go over that in the second, uh, the second lecture. We'll look at the Hitchin vibration. vibration. This is usually as he, did, as, as he proposed it, is for complex groups. And these, in particular, are going to be examples of integrable systems given by BBB brains. So let me just, I'll tell you what these objects are, but for you to remember that there's some type of classification going on that you can keep in your head when looking for examples or constructing correspondences. So we'll see a Hitching vibration. This is for complex groups by BB, given by BBB brains. And another type of brains that we'll hear about uh, in, in a few minutes, are uh, brains which are given by real Higgs bundles, so the case of real groups. So we're going to see how real Higgs bundles lie in this integrable system, and how to understand them through the vibration, and how to understand the correspondences that exist for them. So these are real, real Higgs bundles. And everything is in the setup of integrable systems, so we're not going to study properties of the space itself, really by itself, but inside the Hitching vibration. These are not giving us a Hitching vibration per se because they're not giving us an integral system in the sense that Hitching devised back in the time. So these are examples of what are known as BAA brains. I'll tell you later on what they are. And finally, what I want to tell you about is about other types of integral systems that appear through the study of brains. So there are other real integral systems that appear that are related to representations, just in the way that we were seeing today in the lecture in this morning. Higgs bundles for complex groups work in correspondence with the Nobelian Hodge theory uh, with representations of the fundamental group of your Riemann surface. But you could ask, uh, are there any other uh, relations between Higgs bundles and representations maybe of higher dimensional manifolds, for instance? And these will be given by certain real integrable systems. So real integral systems and other applications so and other correspondences and this will be the other type of brains that available for us type ABA so very soon you'll know what these letters correspond to and you'll know what we're talking about but for you to have in your head we're going to set up say what all these available objects are and then each day we're going to go one by one in the classification and study some examples. We're going to be working on Riemann surfaces, so our objects, we were talking this morning about uh, Higgs bundles on Kähler spaces. Now we're going to focus on uh, our, the K, so take, following the notation from this morning, we say X or 
space that we were working on now is going to be a Riemann surface, so let me call it sigma, uh, compact Riemann surface. And I'm going to ask the genus to be at least two. And the cotangent bundle that we're going to be using very often, now we're going to put it a name, so to the cotangent bundle of the Riemann surface, we're going to call it K. And we're going to take the Higgs bundles just as we defined them this morning, now with this notation. So let's just remind ourselves, uh, Higgs bundle, Higgs bundle on, on the Riemann for it. On, on sigma is a pair, a pair E phi, where we saw E was a holomorphic bundle and phi was a holomorphic section with values on the cotangent bundle. So we're going to write it this way. So for E, a holomorphic vector bundle, and phi, which will go from E to E tensored with K, a holomorphic map. So in the notation that we were seeing, phi, phi is a section, so it's in H0 of our Riemann surface, endomorphisms of E tensored with K. Now this is the, the definition as it appears, uh, as we heard today from Hitchin's work back in 87 when he was studying uh, the self-duality equations, young mill self-duality equations, reduced to two dimensions. So if you reduce to, you can re impose invariance in one direction, and you can impose invariance in two directions. If you do in two directions, then the solutions are Higgs bundles. This is what we're going to call classical Higgs bundles because then we can put structure of complex groups or real groups, and this definition will become a little bit more elaborated. But because we're working on vector bundles on a Riemann surface, these are over each point a vector space, so our Higgs field, which is a section, will be a matrix here. So let's start with an example, the classical example, that will come back again and again for these objects, uh, is when we take the canonical bundle has even degrees, so we can take a square root. So consider, so choose, Choose the square root of your canonical bundle. Choose k to the one half, the square root, so you have two to the two g options, and, comp and make the pair and define, you define your Higgs field to be, to, to have e equals to k to the half plus k to the minus a half, and when you have to make your Higgs field, your Higgs field was the map from E to E tensor with K, so your Higgs field will have to go from K to the half, to, plus K to the minus a half, to K to the half, plus K to the minus a half, tensored with K, and this has to be a matrix, a two by two matrix on this uh, rank two, or dimension two vector space over each point, so phi will be a matrix, and what we're going to say, or we're going to take, is a matrix which is of diagonal zero, omega, one, zero, and if we think about it, what's going on here, where is omega going from? It's going from k to the minus a half to k to the half tensor k, so when we look at it, so omega, this is omega going here, so really the section of a square. So for omega, a section of a square, this is the holomorphic quadratic differential. And one is just the identity, which is going k to the half, k to the minus a half, k. This is the identity on k. So this is a family, this is what later on we'll see is what uh, forms the Hitching component inside the Hitching moduli space. It's a family parametrized by quadratic differential. So for us, uh, all along these uh, talks, we're always going to be considering Higgs bundles which can be expressed as vector bundles with conditions and matrices. And so we're going to be able to take traces of the Higgs field, we're going to take uh, characteristic polynomials of the Higgs field, etc. So 
In order to define the moduli space of Higgs bundles uh, and for it to have nice properties or uh, at least to be to, to give the solutions of Hitchin's equations like we saw today, we saw we had to define stability conditions. So let's remind ourselves so we can apply it to this example what stability conditions are that we need to impose to get Higgs bundles being solutions of the Hitchin equations. So we say that say that we saw today if I can be stable, semi-stable, or polystable, and let's just remind ourselves, so is stable or semi-stable if for every, and we learned that we can call them phi invariant subbundles, so for every phi invariant subbundle, E for every subbundle f of E, so remind yourself that this is, we saw it's a subbundle such that when we apply our Higgs field, we get back to the bundle tensor with the cotangent space. So this is what it means to be phi invariant. For every phi invariant subbundle, we have the slope of the invariant subbundle less than the slope of our Higgs field. So we have the degree of f over the rank of f less than or less or equal than for semi-stable the degree of e over the rank of e. So we saw today how to define, we know what the rank is for a vector bundle, the dimension of the fiber over each point. You can define your degree like we saw today as an integral, integral using the Kähler form, but you can also think of it as a quick remark, as just the number of zeros that the holo holomorphic section will have. So it'll be useful for us in the future to think of the degree just as the number of zeros, uh, zeros of holomorphic sections. So if you have a, an invariant subbundle, you have to calculate this degree, calculate this rank, you evaluate to see if it's less than what you started with, and then you have a stable or semi-stable Higgs bundle. If you have a sum of things that have the same uh, degree uh, over rank, then you have polystable, and this is what we learned today was the slope mu of e. So let's go back to our example and see what's going on here. We have to figure out whether there's any invariant subbundle on these vector bundles. So it, does it happen ever that a subbundle of this direct sum is preserved by the Higgs field? If uh, so, note. Here, if, if our quadratic differential is non-zero, so if omega is different than zero, then actually there's no invariant subbundle. We're always sending, when we put it on a subbundle, k to the half, k to the minus half, we're sending it uh, to the whole thing. So then there is no invariant subbundle. So the pair is automatically stable. The one, the one case we have to consider then is if omega is equal to zero, then what's going on here? If omega is equal to zero, then we do have someone preserved. Whoever we put here is going to be preserved. It's k to the minus a half. So then k to the minus a half is preserved. But when we do our calculation here for k to the minus a half, when we look at this in that case, so, so, Example here for k to the minus a half, a subbundle of k to the half plus k to the minus a half. What's going on? The degree of this thing, the degree, sorry, yes, the, the degree of k to the minus a half over the degree of, of over the rank of k to the minus a half is minus d minus one over one, which is negative, right? So it's less than zero, which is the slope of E. So it's also stable. So the pair that we started with, this is the only preserved one, but it satisfies the stability condition. So the pair E phi in this case is stable for any omega. So the whole family is a family parameterized by quadratic differentials, which are all stable 
in, uh, in the family. So using that stability condition is that one can define the moduli space of Higgs bundles. You define the moduli space of semi-stable, uh, isomorphism classes of semi-stable Higgs bundles. We're going to call it M, and we're going to say M, and here I'm going to put the general linear group because we haven't applied any, any group structure. We're just having the, the general linear group acting on vector spaces. So GL and C is the moduli space of semi-stable or, or equivalence classes of semi-stable Higgs bundles. This is a very rich space. We heard some properties today. We're going to keep hearing properties in both, uh, in both lecture series about the moduli space of classical Higgs bundles. It's a, we, said, we, we heard it was a quasi-protective scheme. Uh, it's smooth under certain conditions. One of the properties that we're going to exploit a lot, we're going to use it a lot, is the fact that it's a hyperkähler space. So we'll go over what the hyperkähler properties are, what it implies, and how to define different types of brains, like we saw here, in terms of uh, the hyperkähler structure. But before we do that, we want to be able to work with any group. So here we said we're going to work with uh, vector bundles with some uh, structure. Here we haven't put much. We define classical Higgs bundles and stability, but we can consider also uh, Higgs bundles for some group. So if we take a complex group, so let me put it here uh, in our list of objects that we're using, we're going to take here the C complex uh, group. Probably one semi simply group. And here, we're going to say what Higgs bundles are for that group. We're going to add structure to our Higgs pair to obtain the complex pair. So, a uh, GC Higgs bundle, P phi, is a principal, a principal GC bundle, Together with together with a holomorphic section phi of that joint bundle associated to P, is the with values on the canonical bundle. So this might seem a little bit too abstract in terms uh, comparison with our matrix uh, description of Higgs bundles. What we we should be happy about is that when we take when we take subgroups of the general linear group, really what we're taking is classical Higgs bundles with some X structure that describes the na nature of the group. So for, for any GC that is a subgroup of G, L, and C, what we're doing is we're taking classical Higgs bundles. So this means classical Higgs bundles plus some structure that reflects the nature of the, of the pair. So classical Higgs bundles is put here plus extra structure reflecting the nature of GC. So what do we mean with this? If we take, if we take G, L, and C, we just have the same uh, classical Higgs bundles. But for instance, if we take uh, S, L, and C, then we have to add conditions. We heard actually what the conditions should be. So if we take G, C, is this okay here? Yeah? Okay. If we take G, C equal to S, L, and C, the two conditions that we heard today we had to add were that the vector bundle has to have trivial determinant, so the top exterior power of our vector bundle, E, has to have, has to be trivial, a trivial line bundle, let me call it O, and the Higgs field as a matrix, because we're talking about classical Higgs bundles, matrices, has to have trace equal to zero. So these are the two conditions that we should add if we have an S, L, and C Higgs bundle. We can go back to our uh, first example, our 
family of Higgs bundles described by a quadratic differential and ask, is this a case of one particular Higgs bundle for some group? You look at the Higgs field and it has trace equal to zero here, trace of phi, it is indeed equal to zero, and you look at your vector bundle and this vector bundle has indeed the determinant of E, the second exterior power, is indeed trivial. So really our family is E phi is, a stable, is stable for every omega and is also a family of SL2C Higgs bundles. So it's stable for omega family of SL2C Higgs bundles. So in the case of SLN, we put conditions on the vector bundle and on the Higgs field. For any other subgroup, we could consider, for instance, the symplectic group or the special orthogonal group. We'll see in the future talks that we're going to consider those Higgs fields and Higgs bundles. And what we're going to do is we're going to have the vector bundle with structure coming from the group. So we'll have some symplectic or orthogonal structure on the group. And then your Higgs field will have some uh, compatibility conditions with respect to that structure. We're not going to see more examples right now here. We're going to see when we see the examples of brains, we're going to construct other, uh, the other cases for other classical groups. Is there any questions? Right. So these are the objects we're going to look at. We're, we have Higgs pairs. Uh, so we're, we're focusing on one particular case of what Richard was telling us about because we're going to work only on compact Riemann surfaces of genus at least two. And the pairs we're going to take are still our vector bundle and our Higgs field. And I mentioned that I wanted to look at this space in terms of, uh, in terms of the integrable system, but I also I want to try to tidy the things that we're talk about, we'll talk about in terms of brains as uh, physicists like using. So we're going to use for that the structure of the moduli space. I'm going to leave the definition of Higgs bundles, but we keep it in our head because very soon, as soon as we start talking about the integrable system, uh, Higgs bundles will stop being just a vector bundle and a section, the Higgs field, and will become a spectral curve and a line bundle on it. And that's the way that the integrable system will appear. So in our head, we're going to keep in mind the fact that we can alternate between spectral curves and Higgs bundles. So one comment before we, we continue is the following with respect to the moduli space, because I mentioned stability, but I'm not going to mention stability much more uh, than now. And we're not going to mention stability much more here. And why is that? So the following thing has to stay in your head with respect to classical Higgs bundles or Higgs bundles for a subgroup of GLN. Stability depends on a preserved subbundle. So stability depends on phi invariant subbundles. So in the best of cases, you don't have any and your Higgs bundle is automatically stable. And that's going to be actually the generic case. When you look at the integrable system, your generic fiber of this integrable system will have all Higgs bundles which are automatically stable. And why is that? Because we can show that uh, some, Higgs, some type of Higgs fields don't have any preserved subbundle. The way that we can do it is by looking at the, li uh, at the um, linear algebra of this pair. So our Higgs field is a matrix. We can look at the uh, characteristic polynomial. So taking, taking the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field, the, so the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field, we can write it as the determinant of the Higgs field minus a variable, say, lambda times the identity. Taking that characteristic polynomial, we can note that any, if, uh, sorry, any invariant subbundle of your vector bundle would correspond to a component of your characteristic polynomial. So if Higgs field preserves the subbundle, then there has to be a preserved subspace corresponding to that. So taking the characteristic polynomial, the, the characteristic polynomial, each 
factor corresponds to an invariant subbundle. So if you restrict your Higgs field to your invariant subspace, it's just like looking at a matrix acting on a vector space. If your matrix decomposes, it means that there is a decomposition of the vector space. This is the same that's going on here. You look at your Higgs field as a matrix, and if it preserves a subbundle, then your characteristic polynomial restricted to that should divide your original one. So any time that you have a, 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 an irreducible characteristic polynomial, there is no invariant subbundle, so the Higgs field is stable. So then, when, when phi has irreducible characteristic polynomial, let's put here characteristic polynomial, the Higgs bundle is stable automatically. stable. And we're saying here, this node, because we define stability, it's a little bit ahead of time because this will come back to it when we look at the Hitching vibration. So in, in the integrable system, that we'll define later today or tomorrow, we'll see that the generic fibers are all made of these things. The generic fibers correspond to irreducible or characteristic polynomials. So we'll be done. Anytime we're studying generic fibers of the Hitching vibration, we'll know that everything there is automatically stable. We don't have to check any stability condition. So this is a comment to allow us to forget about stability. And now let's consider a uh, the modular space, we said we can define the modular space for classical Higgs bundles, and if we extend the definition of stability to, uh, pr to principal GC Higgs bundles, we can define the modular space of GC Higgs bundles, and I'm going to call it just like we used to for the classical case, so modular of GC Higgs bundles. And we'll have to, in order to define it properly, you would have to go through the stability construction for principal bundles. And you'd have to look at um, uh, a Jordan Holder filtrations for uh, the stability. It's not just going to be of a vector bundle, but of a filtration. But we're not going to go into that because everything will reduce into the generic fibers of our integrable system, and then everything will be stable in both situations. So the, our model space is, in particular, hyperkähler. That means that there's a family of complex structures, compatible, we'll say what the compatibility condition is, and there's a family of symplectic forms, or Kähler forms, that are also compatible. Uh, so this is, it is hyper -Kähler, which means we have all this family of objects and we can make a choice of, uh, of three independent ones satisfying conditions. So. <coughs> We can choose from this family three complex structures. We can choose three complex structures and corresponding Kähler or symplectic forms. Corresponding forms. The usual way of choosing these, uh, these structures, I'm going to call them I, J and K, the, compatibil Ooh, the compatibility condition I'm telling you about is that they satisfy the quaternionic condition. So all the square is minus one. And what people usually do is they take I to be the complex structure coming from the Riemann surface. So from, from the Riemann surface. It's a complex surface, so it has a complex structure. Uh, so J is the one coming from the group, the connection. So from flat connection. And 
hence, if you look at the, the moduli space, hyperkähler space, well, uh, the smooth part is hyperkähler space, the underlying manifold, depending on what complex structure we put, we can realize different moduli spaces. We saw today that under non-abelian uh, Hodge correspondence, we can relate the moduli space of Higgs bundles to the space of representation. So we saw that we could look at pi one of our Riemann surface and send it to GC. We saw it for SL, but we can do it for any GC. And there's a correspondence between the space of Higgs bundles and uh, the moduli space of representations, reductive representations. This is what Richard was telling us about, and all the Higgs bundle part dates back to 87 to Hitching, and now here for Higgs for the representation correspondence, we saw it was Donaldson, uh, Hitching, Simpson, Corlett, and many others that were involved. We're going to keep in the back of our head the fact that we're related to representations because we want to find out anytime we have spaces or other integrable systems inside the Hitching vibration, we want to know what the relation is with other representations. And the question that I want to ask, we said we had here a corresponding, I want to put corresponding symplectic forms, omega i, omega k, omega f j, omega k, corresponding symplectic forms. So anytime you have a hyperkähler space, uh, you have compatible Kähler forms, symplectic forms, and, uh, and complex structures, then you can, uh, there's, there's this standardized way of constructing one from the other. So when I give you a subspace of your moduli space of Higgs bundles, you can ask me, is it a complex submanifold with respect to one of the complex structures? Or is it a Lagrangian subspace? So is it maximal, uh, maximal isotropic space? So given the question here, let's put a question here, given, given a subspace, is it, is it complex submanifold? And or, and or is it Lagrangian with respect, with, with respect to any of the complex structures or symplectic forms with respect to a complex structure or symplectic form. And if you ask that question and you're giving a subspace inside this moduli space, you can ask further that subspace, how does it lie inside the Hitching vibration? Uh, so how does it lie inside this integrable system that we'll learn about? Does it give us another complex integrable system? Does it give us a real integrable system? What's going on? So you can ask this question for each of these complex structures and you can ask this question for each of the symplectic forms, which means uh, that we can have three options for each Subspace, anytime I give you, yes. Yes. I want to ask more general if they're Lagrangian. The ones that we're going to find interesting will be holomorphic also. Will be holomorphic Lagrangians, yes. Uh, yeah. But so anytime we have a Lagrangian, we'll Assume it's holomorphic because that will be most of the cases. Yeah. So to keep to keep in mind what type of space we are referring to, whether it's uh, holomorphic or it's holomorphic Lagrangian, uh, we're going to use the following definition, which is a rough definition. So definition. Uh, it's a definition from that we're going to math coming from physics. So. It has other perspectives. So, a Lagrangian, a Lagrangian space, supporting, supporting a holomorphic shift. So supporting a Lagrangian subspace, and it has to be res with respect to a complex, to a symplectic structure. So with respect to a symplectic form, is 
Yes. And a brain. And if it's just holomorphic, it's going to be a B brain. So a complex submanifold with respect to a complex structure supporting a holomorphic shape is a B brain. So let me just tell you some comments about why this is a sketchy definition, but it's still very useful for us. So the type of, uh, the type of sheaf that we're supporting or, or bundle with a flat connection that we're supporting on this brain will be very important when you want to study mirror symmetry between the spaces or the vibrations for us, uh, because it's already uh, quite an open question to know what the, uh, this mirror symmetry does on the subspace. We're going to forget about the thing that it's supported. So we're going to assume for now, uh, so we're going to assume the sheaves, sheaves are trivial. And just focus on subspaces because uh, at least for the moment, I, I'll tell you later on in these integrable systems what the mirror, what Langlands duality predicts to uh, predicts the dual things should be. But there's no proper mathematical proof of the duality even for the subspaces. So even less for the things supporting on them. So we're going to forget about that. The second thing that I want to say is that uh, I'm putting the definition in this order explicit uh, on purpose. So I'm not saying all A brains are these objects. A brain can be other things. They're canonical quisotropic brains. There, there are other objects that are also A brains. So any Lagrangian subspace supporting the appropriate shift will be an A brain, but there will be other things. We're not going to consider them, but if you wanted to study mirror symmetry between these spaces of Higgs bundles and study the Fukaya category and the Drive category, you have to include all A brains. Uh, so it would be important to take others. Yes, the way I said it, I did it on purpose because of Johan's questions. Yeah. I'm going to consider uh, any A brain is a B brain, yeah, in the way I put it here. Yes. And I think it's uh, appropriate. Uh, but that's a note on, I mean, a Lagrangian subspace. Subspace has to be complex submanifold? No, not necessarily. So in the way that I put it, it's not, but I'm going to assume it is. So here I put subspace, right? Um, what, sorry? For the holomorphism like form, but for the other ones, I'm not saying anything. So one last thing to remember what A brains and B brains are, and you'll see from the examples to get hands on how to deduce which ones are which and, and which ones we care about. Uh, last thing that many people that have heard me before talking about these things know that the, my trick already is that A brain and Lagrangian have both A's and the other ones did. So that's the way that I can remember. Uh, so we have A brains and B brains that tells us if you have a subspace, uh, it can be Lagrangian or not, or holomorphic, a uh, complex submanifold or not. First thing, if I give you a non-mid-dimensional submanifold, it's certainly not an A brain. It could be a B brain, but it couldn't be the other one. Uh, so mid-dimensional subspace will be particularly interesting because it could be, uh, well, it, it could be Lagrangian. The second thing is that we have three complex structures, three symplectic forms, so we can have one letter in each of the entries of these things. So we can have really, um, that's counting down, right? Yeah. yeah. So we can have, we can have entries in each of the choices that we made. Note, we made a choice here. We said choose from all the family, the, the sphere of complex structures that we have, choose three independent ones. Well, they're not independent, right? Choose the, these three that we're fixing, I, J, and K. K being I times J. So we fixed these three, and it's with respect to these three that we're talking about A brains and B brains. So if you took a paper and you wanted to see what the brains are they are studying, you have to make sure you make the correspondence with the complex structures first, okay? Uh, because we have the three, 
we're going to have the option of having something that is uh, B, A, A, which for instance means it's a complex submanifold with respect to the complex structure coming from the Riemann surface, but it's Lagrangian with respect to the one coming from the flat connections, and it's Lagrangian with respect to the third one. We can have things that are A, B, A, so these are Lagrangian with respect to the one of the co complex structure, but holomorphic, complex holomorphic with respect to the middle one. Uh, and we can have things that are B, A, 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 B, A, A, B brains. And the last thing that we can have, so we can't have something that is A, A, A. If you have a space which is mid-dimensional and all the three com uh, symplectic forms vanish, it's just by linear algebra, you'll see that it has to have degenerate forms. The forms will be degenerate, so they won't be symplectic, in fact. So we can't have that case. The last case that we can have is a very interesting case, which is BBB, which means it's just a complex, holomorphic, complex uh, submanifold with respect to each of the comp structures. So you can start wondering what are these objects? What are uh, submanifolds which are complex submanifolds with respect to each uh, structure? And even more so, what would be holomorphic shifts supported on them? But that's after you find spaces. A point is a holomorphic sub, a complex submanifold of your model space. The whole space is a complex with respect to all of holomorphic complex with respect to all the structures. But there are not many examples of BBB brains. There are canonical examples you can construct. Uh, once you, uh, once we, we go back to the idea that an example is the whole space. So we said the whole Model A, so MGC, it's a, an example of the, a BBB brain, a space that has the three complex structures and it's a complex manifold for each of them. So that means that if you have a group and you have a complex subgroup of your complex group and you look at that space, so if I have G prime C inside GC and I look at the model spaces of these objects, the model spaces will be also included and it will be a PBB brain inside here. However, that doesn't, uh, unless I give you uh, an explicit reason for what, why that would be interesting, in principle it's not that interesting because it's just taking a subgroup. But these are, these are other examples that could exist, so the whole space, just the point, subgroups, but not many others. A way that we'll uh, talk about in the future lectures of constructing BBB brains is by using mirror symmetry on the other brains that are easier to construct. So we mentioned that we're going to talk about BAA brains, we're going to talk about uh, ABA brains, and I didn't mention the last one because we'll see the following. We'll see that under mirror symmetry, these two are going to be mirror, and so setting one will correspond to setting the other one. This will be a, a self, a self dual the type, and this one will be self-dual, and we're going to focus on these two. If we have time, we'll talk about more of these. The one example uh, that we'll start... Um, so, we're, you're taking... Um, you're going to take subspaces of your moduli space of Higgs bundles, and on that, on that subspace, you're going to look at hyperholomorphic bundles. So, if you, you can take the determinant bundle, or you can take... Uh, have you seen Hitchin's paper on uh, the hyperholomorphic line bundle? Uh, that's an example of the thing that you could put on this brain. So that's an example of the thing you could put on this subspace that would give you a brain. But the brain could also, a brain could also be supporting a trivial shift. So as a, as a brain, it's a subspace supporting something that uh, has uh, in some cases, you, you'll put restrictions. It's a bundle with a flat connection. Uh, a brain will be all that, but you can take extra constraints on each of the two objects. You can ask the, the support to be trivial, just a point, or you can ask your bundle to be just trivial. So for us, we're going to ask the bundle to be trivial and talk about the brain as just the base, to understand first that. But in, indeed, it's important to know what the different conditions that you would need to put, because if you want to do uh, Langlands duality or understand mirror symmetry, you would need to understand how does the brain, how does the bundle support it or the shift go. I'm assuming for it to be trivial.
No, I think it's the same language. It's just that that, that would be if you want to give some further meaning to your brain. No, I don't want it to be non. No, I, I, do, I want it to support a sheaf, but I want to forget about the structure of the sheaf. You can just think of it of the forgetful map that forgets the sheaf supporting on it and just looks at the space that supports it. Yeah, well, the the hyperholomorphic bundle will be on this on the subspace. That's the same, yeah. I think it's the same concept of support. Is your support, is that what you? Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. So the hitching component, and this is where the real Higgs bundles will appear. The hitching component is when you take G a real form, so G real form of GC. So when you take a real form of a complex group, you take you get real Higgs bundles, and we'll see how to see the integrable system for complex Higgs bundles first and then understand how real Higgs bundles lie inside. Real Higgs bundles will give you a BA brain and these in, in particular won't give you a real integrable system. This will give you something inside the complex integrable system. Sometimes it'll be a covering uh, of your base, sometimes it'll be a different slice. The, BA, the hitching component will be a component of a BAA brain, in particular BAA brain itself. You can look at other objects, uh, you can look at uh, see the real Higgs bundles like Indra Neil and Jack and Oscar uh, Garcia Prada we're looking at, those are AAB brains and again this will be self-dual inside the vibration. You can look at OPERS and OPERS will be ABA brains. So you can look at many examples, anytime you have a mid-dimensional subspace you can ask what type of objects they are. Uh, and Finding families, and I'll tell you how to find some families, finding families of subspaces which are related to each other and are of certain types is still a very interesting question both mathematicians and physicists will be interested in understanding. Um, any other question? No? Okay, so one of the interesting facts is why B, while BAA brains don't give you in principle a real integrable systems, ABA brains sometimes they do, and the examples that I'll tell you about are ones that give you real integrable systems related to representation varieties of three manifolds. So we'll go in one higher dimension on the space of representations, we'll also be looking at real integrable systems. Yes, yes. Right, sorry, yeah, so I should have said, what I'm doing is I'm taking the underlying manifold, I'm looking at a subspace, mid-dimensional subspace, and that mid-dimensional subspace I put the different complex structures of the different symplectic forms, and I look at them inside the different, the Dabu, the Betty, or the Ram model spaces. And then they're going to be either Lagrangian or, or maybe nothing, it could be nothing. Yes. Um, okay, so I have... What do I have? Ten minutes left. So I wanted to tell you tomorrow how the hitching vibration works for BBB brains. And this in particular, I'm saying BBB brains to remind you that the space of Higgs bundles for complex groups like Hitchin did in, <coughs> in 87 are examples of BBB brains. 
So really, you can think of all of the ones, all of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, if you if you care about uh, brain quantization or you care about uh, mirror symmetry for brains, you can think about it in terms of the Hitching vibration. The real Higgs bundles, we're going to see it as sections, sometimes sections, sometimes just subspaces of the moduli space, and we're going to see them as examples of BAA brains. There are other examples of these brains. Uh, there are not that many that are explicitly shown, but there are other examples. And <coughs> the other type of brain, the ABA that we're going to look at, is going to be giving us real integrable systems and you'll have applications in three-dimensional uh, real manifolds. <coughs> Before I forget, let me tell you, I didn't give you any bibliography here. If you want to learn about uh, Higgs bundles, just in general, I'll suggest to just go back to Hitchin's papers of 87. There are two papers. And in one, there's a very explicit description of Higgs bundles uh, for SL2. And the example that I put here, and, and very nice construction of the space and the components. <coughs> Sorry. And if you want to look at the Hitchin vibration, it's the second paper of Hitchin in 87. He did a, a one description of the Hitchin vibration that we'll see tomorrow. And a, a, a different approach in some cases, in some, for some of the groups, appear later on in, zero, in 07 uh, by Hitching also, where he was looking at Langlands duality. So in that paper uh, from Hitching also, you can see the relation with Langlands duality. Not in the language of brains, but in the language of the Hitching vibration, which uh, is most useful. If you want to see uh, the real Higgs bundles inside the integrable system, you can look at my thesis in 2013, where I lay down the, the details for some of the groups and the background to form it for others. Uh, there's not much spectral data for real Higgs bundles uh, or uses for them, but yet, uh, and apart from understanding uh, these brains and how they deal with. And the work here is with uh, David Baraglia. David Baraglia, and I'm going to tell you about some correspondences and applications that is work with Steve Bradley. And also, when we finish in the last day, I'm going to tell you some open questions that maybe some of you will be tempted to work on, and I'll be really happy to have you discuss of things that we're working with even uh, Ian McIntosh and some other people on these correspondences. So let me tell you what real Higgs bundles I have. What do I have? Seven minutes. Let me tell you what real Higgs bundles are so that when we start comparing things, we can, we can look at real Higgs bundles. Because we mentioned that complex Higgs bundles, the classical case was just a, a vector bundle and a holomorphic section with values on a contangent bundle. And if we wanted to take a subgroup of a co the complex linear group, then we had just to add some extra conditions on our vector bundle. And something similar happens for real forms. So when you take a real form, so even, even G, a real form of GC, we can look at it's Lie algebra, and we can do a very similar construction to what we were doing for principal uh, Higgs bundles, for TC Higgs bundles. With the underlying thing in our head being that when we look at the Hitchin's equations, the Hitchin equations were asking you for the holonomy of your Higgs field to have values in some group. And if you went further and asked for the values of that holonomy not to be in a complex subgroup, but to be in a real subgroup, you'll see many involutions appearing trying to make that holonomy be in certain place. And that's how the construction of these uh, real Higgs bundles are. The way that you construct them, uh, which is not the way that we're going to use to see in the Hitching vibration, the Hitching vibration will use the, the involutions that I'm telling you appear when you ask for holonomies to be in groups. But the formal way, the literary uh, way of defining them is the following. You have your real form of a real group. You can take the real Lie algebra, and you can take the Cartan decomposition of this Lie algebra being the maximal compact and the complement of this, so a maximal compact. Max, compact. 
And you can complexify all these things to get the complexified Lie algebra. And when you look at uh, when you look at the induced uh, representation, the induced adjoint representation on the group HC, you can see that there is an induced act uh, representation on the general linear group with values of MC. In a, it's using these representation that we can construct to any to any principal HC bundle. A C bundle, we can associate we can associate a bundle which is the bundle itself, so any principal H C bundle, let's call it E, we can associate it we can tensor with the adjoint representation with M uh, with M C. Uh, so it's not really the adjoint bundle that we were taking before for complex groups, it's the one that we take through this representation on MC. And it's using these that we want to, let's just put a name to these, let's just call it EMC. And it's using these that we're going to construct real Higgs bundles. The real Higgs bundles will have the vector bundle coming from the structure of HC and will have the Higgs field whose structure will come from MC. So each of the two parts of your the cartan decomposition will give structure for each of the integrands of, uh, or uh, parts of the Higgs field. So uh, G Higgs bundle, G Higgs bundle E phi is given by and we just, uh, you can intuitively tell me what they are, so it's given by uh, an HC, holomorphic HC, but, uh, sorry, the principal bundle, an HC principal bundle. And a holomorphic, sec a holomorphic section of our EMC tensored with K. So we're going to take Higgs bundles which have further structure. So we decompose the Lie group or the associated Lie algebra. We decompose it into the Cartan form with the maximal compact. We look at the induced representation we look at the bundle that we can associate to any HC bundle, and then we can construct the Higgs field. The involutions that I was talking about are the ones that will give you these decompositions. So by asking your Higgs field to have values coming from MC will mean that it has to be anti-invariant with respect to some uh, involution. And the same will happen here. I'm going to, I, I'm just putting this definition here to close today because I'm not going to use this definition again. I'm going to use uh, the involutions acting on the Hitching vibration, so in the integrable system that we'll talk about. And that will be the way of understanding which points correspond to each Higgs bundles by looking at the integrable system. And then these won't be as useful. Are there any questions? I think I'll finish here. Thank you. Or even even before then, when you're looking at the Langlands correspondence between, yes. So if you if you if I give you a BAA brain that will have something supporting, say that where I forget about it, and I ask you what's the dual BBB brain, you have to tell me something about the shift, and then to tell me something, you have to come back and say ask me what was it that was supported. So trivial in whatever sense of triviality, just forget about them. Yes. I'm just simplifying them for understanding the base. So better than saying trivial, I should probably say forget. Well, people use the forgetful map, right? So use the forgetful map.
What, sorry? <laughs> I always found it very strange that mathematicians use forgetful maps. So now I understand them. Uh, but it's still, uh, the, the sheaf is still there floating, and you can know in certain cases, uh, you can you can foresee what the what the shift should be, and the one case where it's uh, worked out, it's not proven mathematically, but it's worked out, is in Hitchin's paper, Characteristic Classes, uh, from a year or two ago, and there he proposes what the BBB brain should be for uh, UPP Higgs bundles, or unitary Higgs bundles with signature the same value, and in that case he proposes what the dual support should be and what the dual shift should be on top. And that's the one case where the sheaf on top, or the hyperholomorphic line bundle on top uh, is expressed. It's not showing that it should be that, but it, people have agreed that it should be. Yeah. I don't think so, yeah. But it could be to some extent of triviality, trivial in each uh, in each component, but when you go to the other side, you're going to be summing for each component. So, in some cases, for split real forms, you'll have coverings over each point in each fiber of your integrable system. You'll have supporting something that might not have much structure, but then when you go to the dual side, you'll have to sum, and you'll have now a bundle of the rank, the number of covers and structure. So you can come from something that was relatively trivial to something that has much more structure, yes. In principle, conjecturally, yeah. Yes? Yes. So, so we're, what we're going to see is that the Hitching vibration lets you see uh, the Higgs bundle model space as an integrable system, and when you pick real forms, uh, you will have subspaces, which are BAA brains, and you can see them intersect the smooth fibers. So uh, we're always going to be interested in smooth fibers of this integrable system. So you intersect the fibers, and I'll tell you different cases when you take certain forms. So if you take, for instance, the split real form, SL and R of SL and C, you will have coverings. Uh, in those cases, you will have finite intersection of your subspace with the integrable system. And that's good, because anytime you have a covering, you can understand, for instance, the covering in terms of monodromy actions of the covering. You can understand the duality by looking at things on each point. So that will be a particular case to test things. Yeah. And the hitching component will be in that category of things that just give you intersections. 